Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our weekly virtual chat chat program. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, my name is Gulshan, and I'm with American Center Tashkent. So today we have a very interesting speaker. Her name is Brona Claude. Hi, Brona. Hi. So, um, Brona had, has been working for the State Department since 2015. She has been working with technology for more than 20 years. She arrived in Uzbekistan in October and have lived abroad in Germany, Belgium, Liberia and New Zealand. She's very excited explore, about exploring this region when we are all allowed to travel more. Um, in her spare time, she enjoys reading, journaling and creating things, photography, graphic design, video editing. And today, Briona is going to talk about African-American contributions to the science and tech world and inventions. Uh, Briona, thanks so much for your time and thanks for um, agreeing to do this presentation for us today. Thank you so much, Gulshan. So um, I want to remind everyone, please don't hesitate and put your questions and comments right below this video while you are watching us and um, we'll do our best to look at the questions after the presentation and answer them. Um, so Briona, take it away. Thanks. Hi everyone, nice to have you joining us today. Gulshan already kind of went over my background and history. Um, I will just add that at university, I studied government and politics information systems management and education. So I have a wide variety of interest and I'm excited to talk to you guys today. So as you may or may not know, February in the United States is considered Black History Month. It was started in 1926 as a, just for one week, um, called the Negro History Week. It was founded by a guy named Carter, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who believed that we should celebrate the contributions of African-Americans in the United States. In 1972, President Gerald Ford decided to make it for a whole month. And he, uh, yes, he decided to make it for a whole month. So that's now why we celebrate um, Black History Month for the month of February. And the month of February was chosen to honor President Lincoln, who was the president that signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves, um, the African-American slaves in America, and also um, to celebrate abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who was one of the people that really helped uh, raise awareness about slavery. So today, um, I'm sure most of you guys have heard of some of the more fam famous Black Americans, um, President Obama, former President Obama, Michael Jordan, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, maybe some of you have even heard of Dr. Mrs. Rosa Parks. Um, what their contributions are within civil rights, uh, politics, sports, um, but we African-Americans go far beyond that. Um, today, we're gonna talk about a few people that you may not have heard of. Um, the contributions of African-Americans in America goes from education to technology, to music, the arts, literature. Uh, it's a very far wide reach. Um, today, we're just gonna focus on science and technology related inventions because that's kind of where my heart lies. Um, from 1870 to 1940, there were more than 50,000 inventions um, applied for patents, which just means that um, someone came up with an idea and then they went to this office to say, hey, can you please uh, make sure that no one else can steal my idea? Um, so out of the 87% of inventions of people that were created, 2.7 of those were uh, submitted by African-Americans. So for our first topic, um, we're gonna, our first person, sorry, we're gonna talk about Henrietta Lacks. She was um, a woman who went to the hospital for she was having um, cancer treatment and uh, the doctors ended up harvesting some of her cells, some of her biological cells, because they found that she had a very unique um, tracer marker. So she's not technically an inventor, but her um, 
biological cells that were basically stolen from her have been used in countless um, inventions, contributions to inventions around the world, um, including zero gravity in outer space, the development of the polio vaccine. So as everyone knows right now, the big thing is COVID, um, getting the COVID vaccine, not getting the COVID vaccine, the development process. Uh, her cells were used in developing some of the earlier uh, cells, which is just called the polio vaccine. Um, also the study of leukemia, which is a form of cancer, the AIDS virus, and many other things. Our next person is Annie Chesley, Annie Easley, sorry. Um, her inventions, or her contributions, I should say, were related a lot to the field of um, space rockets and rocket mechanistry. Um, her team worked on the nuclear powered rocket systems. So she combined uh, chemical sets to create the boost that gets the rocket up in the air and eventually into space. So um, you don't really hear very much about all of the people and their contributions. So I hope you enjoy some of the people you may not have heard of before. Uh, our next person uh, we're going to talk about is Sarah Boone. Uh, and I have to be honest, a lot of these people I've learned about recently. Um, I didn't realize how many inventions and just different things. Um, so Sarah Boone is not the original inventor of the ironing board, but she customized it to the current state that it is today. Uh, she was born a slave. Uh, she was one of the very first women to receive a patent in America. And she took the form, it used to just be basically a block that was used. Uh, she redesigned it and added a curve and give it a narrower shape so that it's easier to iron. So if you, the next time you use an ironing board, like I did a few minutes ago, um, I will always think of Sarah Boone. Uh, our next person is Mary Vaughn Britton Brown. She was one of the first in, um, persons to receive a patent for the a home security network. So she was living in New York. I'm not sure what you've heard about New York. It's one of our more dangerous cities in America and she felt unsafe in her house. So she tried to develop a way that she could feel more safe without always having to rely on the police. So she invented a camera system that would look out of her peephole and also locking mechanisms that she could control remotely. So um, as time progressed, she used, she added a microphone and a, a button to call 911 or the emergency line. Um, so that was, that's a very nice contribution. For our next person, we're going to talk about Garrett Morgan. Garrett Morgan was sitting at a traffic light in uh, Indianapolis, which is a city, sorry, a city in America, and he witnessed an accident. And he felt like the accident was related to the way that the traffic lights were created. Um, the first traffic lights were, they just had two. It went from red to green and green to red. He thought that it would be a better idea to have a, a capability to warn people uh, that the, the light was getting ready to change. So after witnessing a few accidents, he decided that we needed a three point, uh, three system, a three light system. So the next time you see a traffic light, there you go. Uh, he is also one of the first developers of the gas mask. Um, his gas mask was used to save lives in uh, a cave collapse that happened near his hometown. And then Sorry, and then it was also used in the war, during the war. Uh, a little bit of a variation, but it was the first one. Um, Frederick McKinley Jones, he is known for his um, invention. Oh, sorry. Hold on one second. Uh, it is chai chat, right? So we have drinks. Um, he's known for his invention for a rooftop refrigerator cooler. So he lived in a place where uh, people were to deliver groceries, um, they had to, or to go from state to state, they had to put big blocks of ice in a truck and hope that the food would not spoil before it reached its final destination. So he decided that he wanted to invent something that would create a truck, trucking system. Um, and it, that his creation is still used around the world today. Um, one of the other things that he invented is the automatic ticketing system. Um, when you go to the movie theater, uh, back in the day, it used to just be a piece of paper that you would write down and say, you have a ticket to this. Um, but he invented a system that kind of automated it and made it a little bit faster. He also invented or created the snow plane, um, which is just basically uh, a normal airplane that has skis attached to the bottom. 
Um, he lived during a time where it was hard for doctors to get to different locations without having that extra uh, a bus or snowmobiles and things like that. So he wanted to expand the reach of doctors. Um, and he also invented a portable x-ray machine. So uh, if you're not able to come to the doctor, sometimes the doctor can bring an x-ray machine to you, um, which makes it easier. Okay, now, Dr. Lonnie Johnson, he, I, I'm not sure about, I, the weather from what I've heard in Tashkent is very, very hot all the time. I spent a lot of my childhood in Texas, which is one of the hottest states in America. And when you're hot, all you want to do is just either live in a pool or just live under water hoses or sprinklers or something like that. Um, during my childhood, we spent a lot of time with water guns. And I hate to say it, but I was around. Um, I remember when the first super soaker water gun uh, came out and that was invented by this gentleman. He was originally a NASA engineer and he accidentally invented this super soaker water gun. Um, but it's one of the most favorite pastimes for children nowadays because uh, you can get someone a lot more wet rather than you know just a little sprinkle of water. Um, yeah. Granville T. Woods, he is known for the synchronous multiplex railway telegraphy system, which sounds like a mouthful, but the biggest way to think about it is he invented the system that allows a train to communicate with other trains and also trains to communicate with the uh, train conductor place, um, you know, the place where the people are watching to see which trains if they need to change tracks or something like that. Um, he's often considered the Black Edison. He was around the same time as Thomas Edison. Um, they actually had a lot of fights, not real fights, but uh, patent wars where one person would try to take an invention and claim that they invented it. So um, he has an interesting story. He also invented the air brake, which is the mechanism that grips the tires uh, or grips the wheels, sorry, on an, a train and it slows the train down. And for our next person, Alexander Miles, he lived during a time where they didn't have automatic elevators. So the elevators were invented, but there was a very complicated mechanism where there was a door that would close and then someone had to close another door. There was a lot of winding. It was just a very difficult situation. And a lot, there were a lot of deaths where people would fall down the elevator shafts while they were trying to close or maneuver these things. And one day his daughter almost fell down. Most inventions happen because something happens in someone's life and they're like, oh my gosh, I need, a, I need to find a way to make this better. So he decided to invent something that was an automatic door system uh, to just help keep his daughter safe, but it's also still used today and it helps everybody. Next, Dr. James West. Now, Dr. West is part of a team that invented the microphone. Um, he and his German colleague, they were working at their company and the microphone system was, it wasn't very good at capturing the full sound of audio. Of course, as time progressed today, it's a lot better than it was um, back even when he invented it. But it's a very good way um, to see kind of like the progression, like just because you invent something, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be further developed and adjusted as time goes on. But 90% of the microphones that are used around the world today were use the same technology that Dr. West invented. For our next person, Louis Latimer. So most people probably know that Thomas Edison is credited with inventing the light bulb. However, Thomas Edison's light bulbs, they didn't last very long. You would connect it to a, a port and then after a few days it would die. But that was because if you ever look closely at a light bulb, you can see there's like a little swirly thing. <laughs> um, basically that's just called filament. And what Thomas Edison invented wasn't a very reusable system. So Lewis Latimer developed a carbon filament and that just basically expanded the life of a, of a light bulb. Um, so we have him to thank for that. And uh, sorry, Mark Dean, he is a computer technologist who helped develop the first uh, color computer monitor and also the first gigahertz processor. 
Um, of course, these days our processors are super, super fancy and gigahertz and trigahertz and ball hertz and all of the hertz, you know, they just go a, a long way. But he was one of the first uh, to work on the gigahertz processor. So. Henry T. Sampson. Um, in America, sometimes people will say that he invented the cell phone. Uh, he did not invent the cell phone. What he invented was something that was able to capture a gamma electrical cell. Um, if, you're, if there are any Marvel fans out there, um, Dr. Hulk, Peter Banner, uh, he was affected by gamma rays. So if you think about the same kind of nuclear type system, um, he was able to condense it into a small, um, a small piece that could be used for other things. So his technology was then used for the first cell phones, um, but he's not actually the inventor of the cell phone. Uh, Alice H. Parker, she is one of the few women, um, early female inventors. She is credited with creating an in-home uh, furnace system, so basically a heating system that takes natural gas and converts that into um, usable heat. So I know that in Tashkent, uh, in the couple months that I've been here, I've experienced the natural gas ups and downs and um, the heating system. So I definitely have a higher appreciation of how things are created and the connection between everything. Our next person, George Washington Carver, he was a, um, an, a uh, an agriculturist, agricultural chemist. It's a tricky word to say. Um, he enjoyed uh, trying to find new ways. He was always looking at products and trying to see how many uses he could get out of a product. One of his most famous um, research cases is for the peanut. Uh, he found over 300 uses for peanuts. A lot of people often say that he invented peanut butter, um, but there's, with a lot of things, there's conflicting information um, about whether or not he actually invented peanut butter, but he made us think about the peanut differently. So I personally think he invented peanut butter, but you know, I'm sure it could have been someone else too. Uh, Lisa Goldler, she is uh, a more recent person on the list. She is the one that helped create uh, GIF technology. I'm sure most people have used a GIF once or twice. Um, she's part of the team that helped in invent that. And her software is also used by the Hulu company. It's kind of not like Netflix, um, but mainly just based in the US. Uh, I think they have some international locations, but just think of Netflix, but different. Similar, but different. <laughs> um, and then our next person, Dr. Charles Drew, he invented, uh, he found a way, he was a scientist and he found a way to take blood plasma, which is basically uh, blood in your body. He found a way to uh, encapsulate that and refrigerate it and process it so that it could be used for blood transfusion. So uh, he found a way to make other people's blood safe to transport and use uh, on others. Uh, he was in charge of the first blood bank in America, and he also supported the US and Great Britain during World War II uh, to help with their blood banks. Uh, Philip Imagawali is, he's originally from Nigeria. He studied in America. Um, the reason why I chose to include him, even though he's not an African-American, is I recently found out that my maternal heritage um, is from Nigeria, in fact. So uh, as you can most certainly realize and understand, um, the world is a very large place. And as people migrate around the world for various reasons, you always have some type of tie back to your homeland or your motherland, so to speak. So that's why I chose to include Dr. Philip, or sorry, Philip Mugali. Um, he was one of the first people to invent the supercomputer. There's also varying schools of thought that say that it wasn't him, um, but he helped. There was a, someone invented it, but they had given up on fully processing it. So he came along during his university studies and continued to tinker with it until he got it to a perfect point where microprocessors. So if you have like 
one processor. There's like little bits of processors on the inside. He found a way to make all of those processors talk within that processor, but also add all of the other processors around. So he's pretty cool, uh, especially like I said, as a tech, tech person. Uh, our next person is Dr. Shirley Jackson. She um, was one of the first African-American women to get a degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is one of the most prestigious, prestigious uh, science and technology uh, universities in the world. Uh, she is responsible for developing caller ID and call waiting, which is you know, kind of like mind blowing when you think about that, that just one person or even a, a small group of team were able to develop something that's used so wildly and heavily. Uh, she's also partly responsible for the touch tone sound that you hear when you're dialing the phone. Um, I know that cell phones, you can turn that sound off, but if you've ever heard of a phone, uh, it still has that sound. Um, Jerry Lawson, I'm sure there's a lot of gamers out there. Uh, Jerry Lawson, he was one of the first people to invent a video game system that you could bring into your house that had interchangeable games. So the Xboxes, the PS5s, the PS2s, 3s, um, Super Nintendos, all of those systems, his patent or his invention was what helped bring that about. And for our last person uh, is Marion Crook. She is basically considered the mother of VoIP which is voice over internet protocol. The shortest, the easiest way to understand it is all of the cell phone calls that go not when you're connected to a phone port in the wall. So when you're making a Skype call, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, all of those kinds of things, it all goes based on technology that she helped invent. She has over a hundred patents just specifically for that technology. Um, and yeah, so I think that's really cool as I've, Gulshan mentioned, I've lived in lots of different countries, so it's hard for me sometimes to communicate with my family. And if I had to think about how to get an outside line, dial the country code every time that I wanted to talk to my parents, it probably would happen a lot less. But now I can just pick up the phone and, you know, say, hey, how are you guys doing? Um, things like that. So I hope that was enough information, but not too much information. Um, we could sit and talk for hours and hours and hours about uh, more inventors. I had a hard time choosing. I didn't want to go through too many. Um, I tried to just pick some of my favorites. Um, but yeah, and now if anybody has any questions or wants to know more, I am happy to answer those the best I can. Verona, thank you so much. Wow, that's that's a lot of um, interesting information. and. Um, Actually, uh, it's good to know that um, there are so many black people who invented such important things and we, did, we don't even know about it. And mm -hmm. it's a good reminder um, to everyone. Yeah. Um, so we have um, many people joining us. We have people from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I know we have people from Karshi here. So everyone, please put your questions uh, in the comments and um, Brianna will answer your questions. Don't miss the chance to get it answered right here and right now. Um, Brianna, can I ask you a question? You, as a, <laughs> you as a tech person, uh, what is your favorite invention like ever what ever? invention you, you, yes you mentioned that um there there was that um that you ha you can connect to your family and that that helps you a lot uh mm -hmm. is there anything else that you actually appreciate very much as a tech person <laughs> yeah um i think a lot of the a lot of the little pieces. Um, so, you know, when you have technology, they're all made up of small components. And I think realizing that there's small components that were added, it kind of makes it, you know, really exciting because, you know, one person may invent the microprocessor chip that goes into my cell phone that lets me 
have 35 apps and talk, you know, like I can just press a button and you can have access to information, your banks, your school, you know, so I would say probably the cell phone is my favorite uh, or the smartphone per se. Um, it's probably my favorite one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you tell everyone uh, which state you're from in the United States and um, maybe just um, talk about something it. interesting about your state? Yes, I um, am originally from Baltimore, Maryland, which is in between uh, Washington, D.C. and New York. Uh, but my dad was in the military, so I didn't really spend that much time in that state. Um, I lived in Texas. I lived in Maine, which so Texas, most people know Texas because it's a big state. Uh, Maine is at the very top of the country. Um, I spent a lot of time in Germany growing up. So I kind of in Maryland, one of the things that we're most known for is our seafood. Um, there's a seasoning, a particular seasoning that anyone that's from that area or that region uh, likes to have on any anything that they have, they can have it on. And it's called Old Bay um, because there's a water, a water source that's near there. So a lot of the spices um, that's, and it's also a big football, uh, American football team, American football town, I should say. Um, because it's close to DC, there's a lot of politician, politicky kind of things going on. Um, it's not far from New York, so it's easy to just hop on a train or a plane or not a plane. I don't think anybody takes a plane to New York, but <laughs> it's easy to hop on a train or a bus and just go up there for the day and kind of like hang out. So I like being from that part of the, of the US um, just because it's a good place to a lot of, it's easy to travel there from there, but mm -hmm. yeah. And it's on All the right. water. I, I love the water. It's a, uh, but I have found the Charvark Reservoir here, so I'm okay with water access <laughs> while I'm in Uzbekistan. Yes. Right. We have very beautiful places, water places here too. I'm excited mm -hmm. to explore as soon as we're allowed to. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a very interesting question from Gulnora Bagdalova. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I know she's a USG alum, um, USG program alum. She's, ask, she's saying, thank you so much for interesting presentation. I'm wondering, what do you think about negative impact of technologies on our life and how can we protect ourselves and our children from that impact? Thanks. I think that is a very good question, Gulnora. Um, as I consider myself a millennial. So uh, what that means is I was born in a time where you didn't have technology at your fingertips every day. Um, and I kind of, I've watched the transition happen. Um, so I spent time, you know, where you're outside running around, playing with your friends. You don't even have a watch. All you do is walk, look at the street lights. And when the street lights go on, you knew that it's time to go in the house and have dinner. Um, and a lot of times, or before I worked for the State Department, I worked with kids, with youth, and being with the kids as they got used to, it went from only the older kids had cell phones or mobile phones, then it was the middle schoolers, so like the 10 to 12 year olds. Now I see seven year olds walking around with iPhones and smartphones, and they just have them glued to their face. So I think that this generation that's growing up with technology at their fingertips every day, all day long, it's going to start to develop a disconnect. They're not going to be able to really communicate with people outside of their device. Um, and I think the pandemic has kind of shown that as well, where people just kind of stay, like if they're in their house, they have a connection to the outside world, but they're not actually going to the outside world to experience it. So I think Obviously, technology has a lot of positives. Um, you know, like you can communicate with people. There's advancements in healthcare, mm -hmm. education, um, but there's also a fine line. So I know that uh, at least with a lot of the cell phone companies, they have or not cell phone companies, mobile devices. You can set timers. Um, so that's one thing that I personally try to do. Um, it's easy to stay on your phone all day, especially if you're on Facebook or Instagram. You can just, you know, like 
go, even if you just look at your feed, you can spend an hour. But if you go to each person that's on your feed, you can spend days on there. So I personally try to, I have rules where I don't take my phone into the bedroom. I have free hours where I put my phone like far away. So I, if, I ha if I need it, I have to get up and go get it. Um, and growing up, my family had restrictions. So you kind of had to read a book. You had to read, a read for a certain amount of time and that equaled a certain amount of technology time. So whether that was video games or TV. Um, so I think it's just finding a way. And I think if you work together with your kids, it will make it uh, a little bit easier. And of course, like they all want to be cool and hang out like on the phone and talk to their friends all day. But like, no, you can go hang out with your friends and then we can talk. So it's a, it's a tricky thing for sure, for sure. Good question though. Thank you, Gamora. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gunara. Um, we have a question uh, from Hamid Khan. He's asking, can you tell uh, what is the percentage of population in America are African-Americans? Do you know that uh, um, statistics? I'm going to find out. <laughs> 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 I don't know off the top of my head. Oh, wait, hold on. But I can find out. Uh, 42 million of the population. So it's about 13 percent. Um, but that goes, it's a little bit. So one of my other passions is statistics. So I have always a, a caveat, something else to say when I say a statistics. I'll say it. So it's. 30, what did I say? 30, 32%? 13%, sorry. 13%. But you have to take into account that everyone doesn't answer the question. So we have what's called a census survey that they mail mm -hmm. to everyone's house. So if you don't check your mail or you don't look at your mail, you're never going to fill this thing out. So um it's kind of varied as to who fills it out so you can't really see exactly a precise number um there are obviously pockets or not obviously there's pockets in america where the african-american population is higher um it's typically on the coast who were uh the states that uh, participated in slavery those are like the original locations and most people well not most people a lot of people just kind of stayed in those areas so you know from new york to Georgia, um, Alabama. So if you have America, it kind of like goes like this a little bit. It's expanding, of course, mm -hmm. and there are African Americans all over the country, but um, the big pockets, the biggest cities, um, Detroit, New York, Atlanta, um, those are typically where the most dense population of Africans, African Americans are. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so our next question from M. Irmatov. Can you see the question? Yes, ma'am. I'm reading it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so I think what I have noticed, um, I spent a lot of time in Belgium. Sorry, excuse me. In Belgium. And what I found is and of course, this is just my opinion, not like official rules or anything. Um, what I found is people that live in Europe who are can tie their um, ancestry to back to Africa in a closer time frame. So like, for example, when I mentioned that my mother's family is from Nigeria, they haven't lived in Nigeria for over 600 years. But in Europe, most, not most, a lot of the Africans there have their parents lived in an African country. So I think the biggest difference is just the connections you have to the, your original culture. So I only just found out a few weeks ago that I have Nigerian ancestry. So I only know what I've seen in the movies, which is not reality, but people whose parents and their grandparents still live in a place, you know, you have closer ties to that, uh, um, to that area. I think um, Gulshan mentioned that she's from the Fergana Valley. So while she may live in Tashkent, she probably still goes to Fergana Valley frequently, has still family there. So she knows the culture of Fergana Valley a lot more. But let's say in 50 years, she's not living in Tashkent anymore. 
she's living, I don't know, somewhere else in the world, her fam, her new fam, or her family in 50 years may not be as closely connected to Fergana Valley. So the further, the more time that passes that you're away from where you're from, I think changes your personality and you try, well, not your personality, but what you understand and expect. So like, for example, in America, um, a lot of African-Americans that are there, they have created an African-American culture, but not necessarily tied to the African part of the culture. Like we're not, um, I don't know, like eating, eating foods, for example, like there's a lot of um, West African foods or just African foods in general that are specialties in America. But in America, we have things that we eat like for holidays, like we're always going to have a turkey and sweet potatoes and things like that. But you know, so I don't, I don't know. Is that, I think that answers the question basically. Yes. <laughs> that, that's, that's actually very good to understand. Um, thank you. Yeah. So our next question is from Zilnozan Alimardanova. How do you feel about humans being hacked by artificial intelligence in the future? Do you think we uh, people are subject to being hacked? Yes, 150 million percent. Do I think that? Um, I think there's a, there's a good movie. Well, there's a couple good movies. Um, I, Robot, and Minority Report um, that kind of project what life will look like in the future when robots and artificial intelligence is kind of at our forefront. So with most, th most things in life, you have to have, you have your pros and you have your cons. So you have your positives and your negatives. Um, a lot of things that artificial intelligence has given us is, in my opinion, outweighs the negative effects. But I think we're at a crucial point right now where we have to start putting in some um, restrictions and governance on those um, technologies. Otherwise, they're going to eventually get smarter than us and then overtake us, you know, in like the fairy tale movie type world. Um, I think definitely a lot of um, what's been happening in the news a lot lately uh, with Apple and Facebook kind of coming to war is um, human humans produce actually, I just did a report on this, um, humans produce so much data that you can't even conceptual, you can't even think about it. Um, every day, there's 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. So that's like one, um, like a 50 Zoom piece wrapped around the world five times. So if you have 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, wrapped around the world five times, that's how much data is in the world. So we need artificial intelligence because no human, no one human can produce and understand all of that information. So um, I think you just have to be careful about who you give your information to and how it's produced or how it's um, calculated. So if you have, uh, let's say you gave Facebook access to your email address 10 years ago or five years ago. Um, you want to make sure that you check in every year and see what they now, who else they've given that access to. Um, because when you are not, when you don't pay for something, then that makes you the customer, the customer, you're, you are being sold, basically. You may not know that you're being sold, but if you're not paying something, nothing really is free. Well, except for this chat, of course, but <laughs> a lot of things in the world are not free. So if someone is asking for something from you in exchange, you kind of have to make sure that you know the full range and limitations of what it is exactly that they're asking for. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. It does make sense. Yeah. Um, all right. So everyone, don't forget to ask questions. Let me just check. Riona. Yes, ma'am. Ha have you ever thought about inventing something yourself? Mm. Yes and no. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think of a lot of ideas. Like, oh, I wish this existed. I wish that existed. But I don't have 
the, I don't know what the right word is. Like I have an idea, like for example, oh, here we go. For our, you know how when you have um, doggies, I, I know dogs are not that popular here, but in America, if you go take your dog for a walk, you have a poop bag. <laughs> it's a silly example, but it's gonna make sense in a minute. Um, so people used to put those in their pocket, like the empty ones, they would put them in their pocket and then go to take their dog for a walk and pull one out of their pocket and fall on the ground. Someone invented something small that has like, it keeps all of the empty bags so you can just attach it. So then it's like something really tiny. So I think that we need something like that for mask or for something else, you know, like, so that I come up with ideas all the time, but I haven't actually, I don't know how to make it like real, you know, like you have an idea. How do you turn it into like a thing? Like, how do you, I don't know. I, I don't understand how it works, but <laughs> have you thought yeah. of inventing something? Just as you said, there's something like sometimes you think we need we need to think like this, for example, but uh, why it still doesn't exist. But I can't think about anything right now, actually. <laughs> okay. Well, and I'm I'm not a very you know inventive person. I'm more of a um, literature, Consumer. language, humanitarian. Oh, okay. Okay, which is all very important too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you for actually recommending um, to read um, iRobot. That's that's a wonderful uh, ah, yes. book to read to everyone. So um, everyone take a note and read that book. It's wonderful. Hello, cousin Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> That's great. You are supported. <laughs> yeah. mm. All right. If you have questions, don't forget and put them in the comments. We won't hear from you if we don't see your question in the comments. Why do people say that Nigerians are very smart in research? Do you think so? I have never heard um, specifically that, well, I guess I'll answer the question this way. Um, who's, how do you say that name? Who's Nindin? Who's Nindin, yes. Okay. Um, I think that each culture, each country, everyone has different, um, I think it all ties to the education system. Well, I'll say it that way. I think that if you live in a society where education is encouraged and supported, then your frame of mind and the things that you think about is a little bit more open. So if you are at school from very young, people are talking about all these things that were, <laughs> sorry, I'm just, I just saw the last question pop up. Um, if you think about which, you know, like if you, if all you're thinking about as a kid is, oh, I wish we have not, why don't we have a water gun, for example? Like the guy that invented the water gun, he was an adult, but I'm sure that there were kids who, I don't, I'm sure you guys have them here, where there's like a little gun that you pull the trigger one time and it just goes, psh, psh. Yeah. but a super soaker, like you can pump the thing and it's like, psh, you know, like all of this water. So I think if you live in a place where you're allowed to have like really wild, crazy ideas and you go to a school or you have teachers or adults around you that are supportive of like encouraging your ideas, then I think that is how we get more inventions and things like that. So I think from what I know of the Nigerian culture, they're very strict. The parents are very strict. And when kids are growing up, they're taught that basically education is the most important thing that they have um, that's a part of their life, you know? So they, the, the football, the soccer, all of those things become second to education. So if you live in a place, I think a lot of people say the same thing about China. Um, I think a lot of people say that about Russia for their science system, for the, um, yeah, the rocket, space rocket system. Um, I think it just depends on where you are 
and the the support that you get around around it. If that makes sense, I think that makes mm -hmm. sense. Does that make sense? Okay. A lot. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Gunnar is saying that um, it's very interesting how our e emails can be used. Uh, what harm it can cause um, us. I always leave my email in different websites and don't think that there can be any problems with it except that website sends unnecessary emails. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a really good point, Gulnura. I think um, one thing to think about is uh, I personally have a few email addresses. I have one email address that I give to stores because every store wants to send you 10 emails a day. But if I give that same email address to my kid's school, then I'm gonna miss, hey, Johnny was bad at school today because somebody wants me to go buy a t-shirt or something like that. So I think as long as you uh, monitor your emails regularly, and if you ever have friends that say, hey, I got this crazy email from you, did you send it? That you act on it immediately because then that means that your uh, account has been compromised some kind of way. Uh, when going back to the artificial intelligence question, um, bad people can use artificial intelligence to kind of uh, steal other people's information. So if you go to a store and you give in your e email information and then a bad actor sees that email information, they can then try to run artificial intelligent um, driven programs that will figure out what other things you're into and then try to target you with different um, emails and try to get more information from you. So you just have to be, we live in a society where you can't not share your email address. I think we, we live in a society where you can't not share your email address. So I think you just have to be very careful about what you share and you just have to monitor it the best you can. You have complicated passwords, things like that. Yeah, thank you. And it, it's also very good that uh, you mentioned it's good to have like a separate, would I do have a separate email that I use for yeah. spam and all that stuff? Yeah, exactly. Um, what could be so the most is asking, what could be the most important invention for the future generations? Hmm. I think it's going to be something climate, climate change related. Um, I think that the planet is, I think it's gonna be climate related. <laughs> I think that um, I, I, I spent a lot of a lot of my childhood reading science fiction science fiction books, watching you know TV shows about the future. And I thought that in 2022, 2021, we were gonna have flying cars that we could just, you know, press a button and I could go to Samarkand just by pressing a button. I could go to Kiva by pressing a button. Oh, I want to go see America. I just press a button and go there. So <laughs> I think I think that our mind, or at least my mind, I won't say for everyone, I think my mind can't think about what cool thing is going to be invented. You know, like in the year 2000, I didn't think, oh, I would be cool if I could look at my cell phone from you know, anywhere and check my bank. Like I, I didn't think like that, you know? So I'm sure that in 10 years, something is gonna be invented. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. But I didn't think of it today because I don't think about it, you know? So um, I hope it's something climate related. Uh, I think electric cars, I saw that um, in the last couple of years, Uzbekistan has increased their electric car imports. Um, so I think just finding ways to take care of the environment a little bit better than how we are um, is probably going to be one of the biggest inventions. But like I said, it'll be something else crazy, too, that I haven't thought of yet. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think we'll skip the question about animal unless you want to answer that. I will say tiger uh, because I like tigers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so here's a question. Um, what are oh, the think, traditions and um, holidays that African Americans celebrate in the United States? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I almost talked about that, but then I didn't want to talk too much. Um, so there's a couple. We have 
Black History Month, uh, which typically uh, in, at least in my family, I won't speak for everyone's family. In my family, we would normally have a, um, a meal, like a meal with like cousins and brothers and aunts and uncles and all those people. Um, and then we would kind of just sit around and talk about like the inventors that I mentioned or uh, scientists, uh, can you tell that I really like science? <laughs> or um, artists or poets or people like that. And we would just kind of learn, try to learn something new every Black History Month. And then in the month of June, we have a holiday called Juneteenth, which basically is celebrated in the African-American community because even though slavery was abolished in 1863 by the president, that I mentioned earlier, President Lincoln, uh, we didn't have cell phones back then. So we couldn't send a text. You couldn't tweet and say, hey, hashtag slavery is over. You know, you had to send letters and things like that. So the last slaves in America didn't know that they were free for two years after slavery was officially outlawed. Um, so that holiday is celebrated in June. It's called Juneteenth, June 19th of every year. Um, another celebration uh, that we have that's kind of big, so I would say there are three, um, is called Kwanzaa. Um, and Kwanzaa is celebrated, it starts the day after Christmas. It's a tradition that um, came, it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about how if your last, like if you, you're only one generation from the country that you are originally from, you're gonna bring some of the traditions with you when you go. Like if you, if Gulshan moved to Paris, she's probably still going to make naan the way that it's made here in Uzbekistan, or she's probably still gonna make plov because it's part of her culture, you know? Um, so Kwanzaa is, it's a, it goes over a few days and each day has a different theme. So for example, there's one that talks about community. And then as a family, you're supposed to go do something for your community, uh, whether it's a trash pickup or feeding the homeless or something like that. Um, so every day has a different theme and activity. So I would say those are probably the biggest ones um, that we have, that African-Americans have uh, in the States that celebrate in the US. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So next question from Husni Din. Um, he's asking about big data. Do you think that people who develop such database are allowed to collect information about people through their visa and other bank cards? I think there is a limit. Um, when I go to purchase something with my credit card, I am telling that company, hey, here's my credit card for this $30 purchase or this, you know, whatever, however much it is. I don't expect, I, I'm not giving them permission to keep my credit card and then charge it for 15 other things whenever they want to. I think if they have integrity, if a business has integrity that's collecting all of this data, they only want to use it for good. You know, they want to, you bought a yellow t-shirt yesterday, maybe in a month, we're gonna send you a blue t-shirt for sale or something like that. So I think there, um, as I mentioned a second ago, there's a lot of data in the world that's not, no one is looking, no one's looking at it. It's just being collected, collected, collected. And it's definitely important to start looking at how that data is used um, and where it's stored. So even though you may have given your permission to desport for 100,000 Zoom, D-Sport, what is D-Sport going to do with that data? Are they keeping it somewhere safe? So I think businesses have to start looking at ways to keep information that they collect from their people who trust them. They have to keep it safe from other entities. So I don't think that a, a, credit, a company should use your credit card or your visa or something months later just for what you've signed for at that time. So, yeah. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yes. Um, Brianna, what, what would be, we're coming to, to the end and um, just um, since we have a tech person here, yeah. Um, so what's your recommendation to everyone to 
stay safe online. You know, we're go with this pandemic situation, everyone is online, everyone is um, doing something on the internet. Uh, what's your recommendation to people to stay safe and um, uh, to kind of protect themselves uh, on the internet? I would say- I mean, uh, protect their data, personal data. Right, while they're on the internet. I would say that most, the biggest, well, there's a couple, a couple things. One, make sure that you're checking. If, if you ever receive an email that says, oh, your account was compromised, please log into this site, but only click on this link in this email so that we can help protect your account. Most of the time, that information is called phishing, which basically it's when a bad person sends like 100 people an email that says, and hoping that at least one person says, oh, you just gave me your information to your university or to your, you know, something like that. So I think for one, not giving people your password that shouldn't have your password, which is nobody, by the way, you should just keep your password to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, don't share it with anybody, like your cousin, your friend, your brother, your mom, nobody else should have your passwords to your things. Um, you can if they, uh, well, yeah, I would just say that, say it that way. Um, another thing that's important is make sure that it's a trusted site that you're giving your information to, especially if you're paying with your, um, what's it called, your G, what's the money card, ooze card, I think it's called? Ooze card, yeah. Yeah, um, you wanna make sure that it has the little lock when you're looking at the, the website where it says, you know, like streamyard.com, it has our little lock. So that way I know it's secure because it's using a, I can get very technical, but it's using a secure uh, protocol, like a, a layer of, so you have the website and then there's like a layer of security kind of like slabbered onto the top of it. So that's how you know that it's good because it has a little lock. Um, and then what are some other ways to stay safe? Um, just like I said, just kind of making sure that you're paying attention to your emails, um, which websites you're giving access to, um, and just, just kind of like try to share as little information as you can. Like, for example, this would be a good point. On Facebook, you shouldn't have your birthday, you know, May 13th, 1986, or probably 2006, because everyone's like a baby nowadays. Um, and then you were born in, you know, Fergana Valley, because those are all things that people can use to try to get your password. Uh, sometimes they post those quizzes where it's like, 10 questions and you think it's for fun. It's like, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite animal? What's your birth town or, you know, things like that. That's all people trying to get more information about you so they can try to guess your passwords and steal stuff from you. So um, just being careful about how much you share is that's my, that's my final point. Be careful. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's great. That's wonderful tips for yeah. everyone. Thanks so much, Brianna. Um, yeah. So I think we have to wrap up here and um, it's been a wonderful hour with you, Breonna. Thanks so much for taking the time to sharing Thank with you. us this interesting information. And um, it's very timely because it's uh, Black History Month right now. So mm -hmm. uh, we're going to celebrate together. Yeah. Thank you. And just one note really quick. Dil knows that I did not know about that person, but I will go look them up. So thank you for the notes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Alpha is me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thanks yeah, so and much, Busan. Thank you, Briona. And thank you, our um everyone who was watching us and asking yes. these wonderful questions. Um yes. and everyone join us next Friday as we're gonna ha um we're gonna be speaking about American literature with an American writer, Abby Britton. Um, so thanks everyone, Briona. We hope to see you again. Um, thank you very much. To talk about, thank you everyone. About something else. <laughs> All right. I can talk a lot. Good weekend. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Talk to you bye later. Bye. See you. See you.